and she ended up breaking the door down and finding her son in the bath with significant injuries uh, when she believed that he was in his room playing video games. And it was the change in tone from her believing he was fine to finding him in the bathtub. That was the hardest thing that I've ever done in this job. Kia ora, uh, my name is John. I'm an emergency communicator for the New Zealand Police. Um, welcome to a day in my life on a Friday late shift. We'll give you a quick tour of what an emergency floor looks like. This is our uh, purpose-built training room. So when there's no training in here, all these are uh, extra terminals for the busy shifts. It's a little wellness room. If you take a tough call, just you're allowed to just go red, talk to a supervisor and come in here for 10 or 15 minutes if you need it. It's not super often, but every now and then you'll get that one um, call that you just can't shake or um, it's real emotional and it just gets the better of you and after you hang it up, you just need to be off the floor for 10 minutes to sort yourself out. This is the communicator side of the room. So all the people that you see here, they'll be on triple one and star triple five in general. Uh, to my right is what we call the bridge. Uh, so you have a dispatch team leader and a call taker team leader. Uh, you have your section manager um, and then your shift commander, which is a sworn police staff. Uh, this side of the room is where all the dispatchers sit. The call takers are taking calls from the public and the dispatchers are reading the jobs and sending the units. Last seen decamped on foot, heading northbound, described as Caucasian, average height, early 30s. Any units in the area? So every desk has three screens, a phone, quite important for answering calls, note paper, keyboard, mouse, your attachment point for your headset, and every desk is adjustable, so it goes to the ground and then goes all the way up to standing as well. Um, I like coming in a bit early and um, finding myself a desk and getting myself set up, so I will be ready to take calls. But right now, it's coffee time, so we're gonna go upstairs and meet the people that run emergency comms. The baristas, come on. <laughs> Um, Friday and Saturday night late shifts are my favourite because the phone's just constantly going, always busy. It really keeps you on your toes. But it's also Friday. Fire up, come on. Get it together. This is the police with the emergency. Um, domestic violence at my daughter's house. She just rang me. What's her address? Is that in the city area? Yes. Okay, what, what's your daughter said? Um, she just rang me and she was screaming and her partner was yelling at her and North next one heard like a bang and then the phone went dead. He, he's got a violence of hitting her and she's pregnant. Okay. So she's pregnant and you think she's being assaulted? Yes. You need to be good at what they call active listening. So you need to be not only listening to what the informant is telling you, but listening to their tone so you can understand it, listening to what's happening in the background. Okay, what's been going on? I can hear a lot of screaming and distressed children in the background. And also quite important to just listen to what you're being told so you don't have to ask people to repeat themselves. Can you um, move away from her and speak to me, please? No, no, don't tell me to hold on, please. I need the address. When people call 111, they're not having a good day. but. The best thing that you can do as an informant is listen to what you're being asked and just answer it. Everything that a call taker does is around staff safety and trying to provide information for the street staff so that they know what they're coming to. Because the police can find out what's happening when they get there, but it's more important for them to know who we're going to see and if there's any safety risks around those people before they arrive. Okay. And he has a history of being physically abusive? Yes, he has. Okay. Do you know if he's likely to have had any alcohol or drugs today? No, I don't. Okay. Do they have any dogs there at all? No. Okay. Do you know if he has access to any firearms at the house? No, I don't. The informant was the mother of the person she was calling about. Um, she's had a call from her daughter today um, and her daughter's been screaming down the phone. Um, she can hear her partner aggressive in the background and there were some banging noises before the line um, cut out. So we've got police en route to the address at the moment. Uh, I've tried to call directly for first-hand information, but she's not picking up. Um, hopefully the police can get around there pretty quick and check on her. 
This is the police. Where's the emergency? Number 18, what road? You've just hit a lamppost. Okay, are you injured at all, sir? This was regarding um, your ex-partner smashing up your friend's car. All right, so sorry, just in terms of the blocks that were on the vest, was it one big block on the front and one on the back, or were there lots of little ones? Is it, is it your car? And you've come out and opened the door and found a person inside it? Has he come out of his room at all in the last two days? Has she got any weapons? Has she got any weapons? Has she got any weapons? The information that we get from members of the public that call in is really important towards staff safety. Um, offenders with weapons, alcohol, drugs, um, aggressive behaviour, and that then is fed onto the staff on the streets so that they can make a proper risk assessment. Uh, we have some very talented people that are taking calls. They are dealing with stressed members of the public um, and we need to look after their mental wellbeing. That's why we rely heavily on our, our wellness um, side of things. So communicators deal with a range of tough calls and, and tough conversations. Um, often when you get highly emotionally charged informants dealing with something that's personally stressful or life-threatening, that rubs off. So while we have to stay calm on the phone and be professional and get the job done, our hearts will be racing while we're trying to actually make sure we get this person help. Um, children crying in the background, male, female screaming at each other. The f it sounded like the male was possibly um, harming the female because you could hear the female in the background saying, like, leave me go, leave me alone. So I just um, get really, like, sad when I hear children crying in the background. It can get quite emotional. So you want to make sure the children are okay. If you take a particularly difficult call, usually your supervisors are aware of it before you end the call because they watch all the priority jobs come through on their screens and they're usually aware of what's going on. They're pretty good. And you can just jump off the floor and go and, go and grab a coffee and go for a walk or go sit outside for 10 minutes or so. And if you're okay to carry on, then you can carry on with your shift. Um, if you're not, they'll most likely let you go. If you're not able to do the job, it's more dangerous for everybody else, so they'll let you go. Not because you're, not because you're weak, but because you're human. Okay, they're getting into our red vehicle. Your Sunday, Monday overnight shifts are usually pretty quiet, so you might get uh, 10 to 15 minutes between taking phone calls. I like to read just to get myself occupied. People do uh, puzzles, they have like crossword books or Sudoku books or yeah. Um, my section plays a game called Would You Rather. Um, it's just a good way to keep yourself engaged and keep yourself awake for night shift. Okay, would you rather be Hi. able to talk to animals or speak all foreign languages? Ooh, probably foreign languages. Really? Yeah. But animals? Because what if my dog hates me? Yeah, true. Probably. Sounds like a you problem. They are breaking. <laughs> What about you? Um, I probably want to talk to animals. You are an animal, I'm trying to speak to you. Me? A bit cheeky. <laughs> <laughs> the best way we can help people feel safe is by remaining calm and letting people know that we are here to help them and that there is help coming. Um, and we often give a lot of advice around trying to keep themselves physically safe until the police get there. Oftentimes we'll stay on the phone with somebody until the police actually go 10-7 at the address. Just as kind of a reminder of, yes we're here, yes we care, and we are coming to help you. Um, and we kind of just that lifeline between them and the units that are on the way. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we've got police and ambulance yeah. coming down to check you all over now. All right, they yeah, be too yes far they away. are. Yeah. Okay, I'll leave you with them then, thank you very much. Brilliant. Steve. Okay, thank cheers. You. Thank you, bye-bye. Knowing that you spend nine and a half hour, 10 hours a day helping people is just priceless. There is a large workforce of hundreds of people working behind the scenes that don't wear a vest and drive a marked car with lights on top. An invisible front line's quite cool, I like that. It's quite a cool concept and it really does fit across the board of all emergency communications. It's currently about 11 p.m. 
Um, thank you very much for joining us in a day in the life of a police communicator uh, here in Auckland. Uh, we hope you've learned a little bit about the job um, and maybe enthuse some of you to apply as well.